two branches to merge and get, and sad I could not merge to both. I merged the branch less traveled by, and now all the buildings are broken. <laughs> I'm Corey Quinn. Uh, I, am, I generally tend to spend most of my time managing engineering teams, usually site reliability engineering. I'm taking a couple months off to keep the press, and, and I'm figuring out what's next. But for now, I'm spending that time traveling around and inflicting my personality on audiences like you. So, sorry about that. Uh, my Twitter handle is up there. Please feel free to tweet at me as it appropriate. I'm always thrilled to get people asking me questions, including but not limited to what is wrong with you. Okay, let's talk about Git. Uh, but to start off by promising something, uh, specifically that everyone in this room is going to learn something. If you are one of the Git authors, you're about to learn how I mistreat your baby. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, one thing I do want to call out though is that I'm about to make fun of a lot of really stupid things you can do with Git, but everything that I'm about to make fun of, I did in production. <laughs> so the best way to, to really uh, own your failure is to turn it into a conference talk. The hard part I have is finding enough conferences to list all the stupid things I've done in my life. So uh, this is a start. When you screw up on something, own it. So let's start at the very beginning here. Uh, who here uses Git? Who here wishes they used Git? Who here is raising their hands because they're staring at their phone or their laptop and they want to pretend they're engaged? Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> so what does Git do? It tracks changes to files and directories over time. It helps us collaborate with each other. And Git is very, very simple at its heart, which is invariably why in these presentations the next slide looks something like this. <laughs> yeah, it, that's about as clear as mine, uh, because there's an elephant in the room. So let's go ahead and introduce it. No matter who you are, at some point, you wind up getting very confused by something Git is And you're confused, you don't know what's next, and you're scrambling for stack overflow. The only question is how far down that path do you get before that feeling hits? So why, if it is simple, why is it so complex? Apropos of absolutely nothing, it was written by Linus Torvalds, who is famous for three things. Uh, the first is writing Git, which is why we're all here in this room right now. The second is creating Linux, which is why most people in this room are employed. And of course, calling people morons. <laughs> <laughs> He's really good at all of those things. <laughs> so, despite its complexity, Git does let you do some extraordinarily powerful things. Powerful, of course, in this talk, is a polite euphemism for stupid. <laughs> Let's go over to the demo reel. Too much of a surprise. I'm creating a Git repository inside my current directory. I'm blindly adding everything. Your first indication you're doing something possibly dumb is when it hangs for a while on a local operation. It is designed to be extraordinarily fast. It's one of the big benefits it has over previous generations of version control tools. So, okay, when it finally commits that, we're just going to ignore that. We're going to finish that operation. We're good. tells me faithfully that it has in fact committed a file here called ubuntu.iso. <laughs> it created the uh, .git subdirectory that contains all the repository metadata. And that repository is now 173 megabytes in size. Well, that seems a little suboptimal. Status. Sure enough, it tells me that that uh, that it now is it, it's on track 
it can be added to the repository. But I still have an enormous Git directory, because what Git does fundamentally at its heart is it retains a snapshot of every commit dating back to the creation of the repository. So this is not, there are not a lot of great use cases for committing large binaries directly into Git. You can, you can do it though. Git is not opinionated in that sense. You can commit large binaries. You can commit atrocities in Git. If you wind up needing to store large binaries, there are two tools out there that tend to really speak well. It's one is Git Annex, which was uh, created by Joey Hess, uh, Debian developer, and Git LFS, which is supported by GitHub or GitHub, depending on the pronunciation side of the fall on. And they're sponsoring a lot of the development on Git LFS. Now, most of us aren't committing large binaries to Git repositories after the first time we make that mistake, but we do often commit to things that we probably shouldn't be, like secrets. Um, if you wind up accidentally committing this to a, to a uh, repository and you don't want to blow the whole thing away, the way to extract data uh, really come down to either Git filter branch, which is arcane, confusing, and annoying to work with, or DFG, which is written in Java and winds up causing tremendous piles of uh, stress. But it's fast. It's great for stripping out things like API keys, etc. This is not just a trivial exploit that people are doing this on an ongoing basis and winding up there. Suddenly someone has spun up a bunch of Amazon instances to mine Bitcoin. Um, most some shops do, do sanely commit secrets to Git, but they encrypt them first using a variety of different technologies. So, Let's move on to another terrible idea. You can, well, I don't even really know rightly what this is. So, we create a repository. And if we take a look at what's inside of that subdirectory, this is the heart of what makes it a Git repo. It contains metadata, it contains objects, it contains pointers to what the current state of the branch is. It even has a local, it has a local configuration that's repository specific, it has its Git hooks. But all of these are just files and directories like anything else. I like keeping track of these things. There's a tool I like to use to do it. <laughs> inside a Git repository, and you can keep doing this, and believe it or not, it does work. I have no earthly idea why you would, but you can. Well, you can revert after you stole a lot of Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> See, someone gets what we're talking about. <laughs> How come this Git repository is for spans to fill anything I check it out on? Well, funny story. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> How often has this happened to me? Well, maybe not being able to type out all the time. How often does this happen to you or something like it? You start typing a command. And because I'm a, uh, the way that I tend to get commands and get code in, uh, I'm a full stack overflow developer. So what I wind up doing is copying and pasting from stack overflow the command I want. Let's pretend for the sake of argument, it's git status. Hey, git is not an, an actual command. Did you mean this instead? <laughs> Idiot. Yeah, so it's, that's not really great. But there are ways to fix this. Notice that this fits in a tweet. Apropos of absolutely nothing, that's where I stole it from years ago. But,
start with the word git, which is suboptimal. Uh, so if you want to do anything that doesn't require being inside Git's world or going a little larger than that, you often have to back up the shell itself. For example, I can set shell aliases like this. Now, why in the world would I do something like that?
So how often has this all happened to you? You try to push, you say, ah, there's no upstream tracking branch for that. And this upsets you. So you type profanity into your terminal. And then it works. <laughs> It's the ultimate do what I say, you know what I mean, not what I say command. More notable than the technical accomplishment is the fact that this is the first result on Google when you punch in the fuck. <laughs> that is masterful SEO. <laughs> so humor aside, I do have a few legitimately useful tools that I want to present to you folks today. Um, let's face a bit of an uncomfortable truth. Speaking as a manager, an awful lot of my peers, and sometimes me, tend to present at times like semi-intelligent squirrels looking desperately for something shiny. I feel like I have an animal back to the So, when I was at a previous job, what happened was I had just taken over the team, the monitoring system was completely defunct and not, not presenting anything, and the display sitting next to my desk was showing data that no one cared about. I didn't have a whole lot of time, but I wanted to do something to trick my new co-workers into making the fatal mistake of coming by and talk to me. So I wanted to put something interesting up there. And here's what I did specifically. It's a tool called Gorse. Okay, so I actually put this on the screen, doesn't it? Sorry about that. Okay, it's a tool called Gorse. And what that functionally does is it traces the Git repository. Okay, there we are. It traces a Git repository through time and winds up just presenting a visualization of this. So you have different developers coming in and making changes to things, and it's very visually appealing. And what happened next was kind of interesting. I mean, technically, it's, it's great, it's pretty, it doesn't provide a whole lot of value. But people would come in and tell stories. They'd say, oh yeah, remember we merged that module in? Or in the early days of the company, you'd have one of the founders going in and changing a bunch of files. And then one of the engineers going in and immediately reverting all of the changes that were just made to that bunch of files. And it becomes more or less a shared narrative. And that was that was something that was fun. So it doesn't take a whole lot to do. This is available. It is open source software. It is available in Homebrew for Mac. It's available in almost every uh, Linux desktop available. I don't know or care if it's available on Windows. Sorry. <laughs> So, audience participation time. Uh, let's start with a poll. Uh, does anyone here have more than one Git repository that they care about? Look around the room for people without their hands raised. They work at Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for everyone else, it sometimes sucks to realize that you're on a plane and you're missing the latest change that one repo you need. Or after working on stuff for a while, you realize, oh wait, you're working on a week old uh, revision rather than what's currently there. It's unfortunate. Um, Mark Atwood over at HPE last I checked uh, had a decent solution to this problem that he wound up posting. Uh, you punch a find command, it will for loop to find Git repos to iterate over it, then you put actually the latest changes, and that directory's parent, and at this point, half of people are asleep here because. This, this works, and it's really awesome, except for the part where it's shitty to remember it, type it out, etc., and run it every time. So I might do something like this once, but I'm not going to go down that road every time I want to update stuff, even with an alias. So I twelve back at him. Uh, I took that painful loop, but instead of running git fetch, I ran a different command. In this case, mr register. And he responded with, this is awesome, thanks. And the reason I bring this up is not solely to say how awesome I am, but to point out that we are all always learning. 
Uh, Mark is someone who has forgotten more about software than I'll ever learn, and he was unaware of this thing. We all tend to stand on the shoulders of giants in this space, and we're also almost never the first person to have a particular problem that we're wrestling with. And everyone around us has holes in their knowledge that are different than the holes that we have. Everyone here knows something that is blindingly obvious, that if they said it out loud, people around would say, wow, that's great. It becomes amazing. Uh, during the Q&A section for some of my talks, uh, people sometimes raise their hand and say, well, I have a really dumb question. And you see people in there who are, yeah, that's a really dumb question. But when I dig in an answer, those people are taking an awful lot of notes. So we all tend to not want to necessarily ask the dumb thing, but we should because it helps enlighten people around us. Open source has always been about community and about giving back. So let's talk about what MR is and does. Uh, they changed the name from MR to my repos to make it easier to find, but I still haven't gotten the hang of it quite yet, so I still refer to it as MR from time to time. Uh, they managed to take the traditional hard problem in computer science of naming things and made it worse by renaming something. <laughs> so step one is you run MR register inside of a given repo. Uh, you can automate it like that loop. You can do it by hand, but Either way, it doesn't really matter because you've only got to run it once. This in turn winds up building a config file in the user's home directory. The next thing that you do is you run operations across all of those repositories by replacing git with the word mr. And I will in fact give a demo of this. So if I go up one more level, I go from having four to having eight, and it tells me where all of these things live. So I can do an MR up, and it'll automatically go update one at a time, so on and so forth, over a slow connection. Or I can give it the concurrency flag, dash dash jobs or dash j, so what is GCC. And it'll do all of these things simultaneously if we can pretend that the wireless would behave itself. Yeah, like that. of the MR config, we have a few default uh, commands here, in other words, different commands that you want to uh, potentially alias, as well as giving us an include section, where you can include other files. So I can have a separate MR config that looks a lot like this, that is specific, for example, to my employer. So here's just the list of things at this company, and there's a 50 repositories we care about that I want on my machine, but I don't want those on all of my machines, so I can start breaking them out uh, that way. We point to where the uh, repository lives, and it does the rest. It's worth pointing out that this supports a number of other version control systems. It is not specific to Git. Um, Perforce is not on this list, but patches are always welcome, which is the open source polite phrasing for go away, kid, you bother me. <laughs> The third step with a tool like this is to pass it on. Because I wouldn't know that this tool existed if a stern German friend of mine hadn't told me about this. For all of their faults, Docker gets this perfectly right. I mean, the first rule of Docker is never, ever shut up about Docker. It's the inverse fight club. <laughs> One more tool that I do want to point out is called VCSH. It was written by a different Debian developer and the stern German friend who pointed out and marked me. Um, who here has a global uh, dot files repository that they wind up keeping somewhere? Yeah, okay, so it's a fairly common approach. It often looks a lot like this. And I argue that this is a suboptimal slash crappy way of managing your dot files if you have multiple machines. Uh, for example, I don't want, I have a Git repository that has my personal AWS uh, credentials in it, mostly because I'm a moron. 
but I don't want that living on my work machine. And I don't want anything that has work credentials living on my personal machine because I have hobbies that don't extend to getting sued. So what I wind up doing instead is using something called an MR that lets me be a little bit more prescriptive with regard to what repository, what things are checked out on a given node. Sorry, VCSH, I don't know. Wow, using the wrong term here. So if I run a VCSH list, it shows me a bunch of different repositories that I'm currently managing. In this case, let's use SSH as an example here. By running that, what I've now done is I have dropped into a environment into a uh, environment where the Git I'm now inside of a Git repository, which does live elsewhere on disk, but it is controlling uh, files in this directory. So if I do a git status, oh, I can't see how I'm get What was that? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, in this case, it shows that I'm uh, running a, that the only file that's managing is my .ssh slash config. But if I show where I currently am, I'm still just hanging out in my home directory. My location hasn't moved. It's no longer tracking any other files than that one. Incident, the way I avoided, I avoided grabbing everything, which is really not a fun game to get into, of checking your entire home directory into a Git repository, much less multiple Git repositories, is that I dropped the Git ignore file in there with the wildcard. What this means is that if I want to add a file to a VCSH repository in this context, I do have to give it the force flag, which is dash F, which is a relatively small price to pay, as I see it, to in order to manage these things. Yeah, so I make my changes, I then uh, log out, and I'm still right where I was. So you can have different remotes for it, and it effectively lets you manage multiple, uh, uh, multiple repositories control what is in a common directory. It doesn't go all of the way, but it does uh, go a long way toward combating uh, the use and misuse of another terrible idea, specifically um, Git submodules, also known as a reason to drink. So what this is doing, just to uh, run through this a bit, is I wind up having a MR, I use my .config directory, which is a uh, XDG, uh, I forget where this originally came from, the Debian folks are huge on it, where I have a .config where I stuff a lot of these things. There, in turn, is a um, MR directory in there, which lists both what is available and what is, and then what's similar to do it to what's on this node. So in this example, uh, I, I would, for example, have a Vimperator option in available.d that is not symlinked in. So as long as I don't symlink that, it's never going to check that uh, repository out on this box, which means that data isn't there. All I have to do is just add or remove that symlink, and it winds up controlling what winds up being in there. The repository itself lives under the VCSH config repo.d directory for the box. So in this case, we have a zsh.git bare repository there that then in turn winds up having its files checked out into the parent. And I will have a link to this tool at the end. I do have uh, two last tricks that I want to point out that I've been showing you without calling attention to the fact that I've been showing them to you. And they look a little bit like this. inside of a Git repository, you'll notice that my prompt is changing all the time to reflect what the current status is. In this case, it tells me I'm on the master branch, and there's a red dot and a red one next to it. And what that's telling me is that there's a file that is staged but not committed. Once that's done, that red dot turns into a green check mark, which in turn tells me that this is again an output of the status command of I'm on the master branch, and my branch is ahead of origin master by one commit, which explains the up arrow with the one next to it. Uh, one bit push later, 
and I'm in a, a position now where it's just master, green check mark, all the way. Why is this helpful? Specifically because it, it serves as a constant indicator of the current status of what I'm doing. It gives me a visual reminder that I don't have to ask for to tell me whether I'm on the master branch, the develop branch, a feature branch, and what the status is. Is there a merge conflict that I should be paying attention to? How far ahead or behind am I? It just tends to help prevent, on a subliminal level almost, me from making mistakes as often as I would otherwise. The last thing that I want to show up as well here is I haven't been running Git for most of these. Yes? Yeah. I, I like doing that. Because then I go into the Linux source directory and it takes forever to mm -hmm. run through the directory. Yes. Do you have a uh, yes. The quick question, the quick, I mean, sorry, to repeat for the video, the uh, question was specifically whether or not, like, what happens if you go to a giant directory and it takes forever? Um, this is parsing the outputs under the hood of git status. Generally, running git status, even the Linux source directory, shouldn't take a stupendous amount of time, in my experience. So if it is, there might be something else to put. Alternately, what's possible is your implementation of this might be doing, ignoring that, hooking a library that takes a long time to iterate through things. It's going to depend. There's a lot of different tools that provide that functionality. The one I use is, uh, this is actually shelling out to a Python script of all things. And it tends to be fast enough that I never notice a problem or even any noticeable lag on any machine since 2010. Okay. So I'm not saying that's the best answer to it, but that's how I would solve it. Well, the last thing I want to point out is that I'm running, uh, I'm not running Git itself, I'm running Pub, which is something that GitHub offers as a wrapper script around Git. What it does is it intercepts everything that I wind up doing with Git that it doesn't understand and it apply itself. It passes it through to the native Git binary already installed in the system. But it does add a list of GitHub commands as well. So I can do pull requests, I can fork things, and it makes it a lot easier if you're working with things that live on GitHub. I'm unaware of other companies that are offering the same type of Docker script, but it's not that difficult to build, and it's something that I would strongly recommend. It tends to make life a little easier than my comments. Yeah, feel free to grab a picture of this. These are links to everything that I've mentioned today. Uh, that everything is non standard built into cut and do uh, Git. And a few things I didn't mention, um, specifically GitHub. No, that was not a mispronunciation or a typo. It is a gem that you install. And whenever you run GitHub, it's a level by level progression through doing different things with Git. It creates a, it creates a new repo each time in a certain state and gives you a challenge to complete. Once it runs the tests and that challenge has been passed, you move to the next level. Last time I checked, there were 45 of them. It goes through basic stuff like how to add a file to a staging area, how to wind up committing, into you how to explore the ref log, how to wind up doing a binary search, how to do the git bisect, how to do all kinds of relatively complex rebases. It really is a great way of getting up to speed in a relatively short period of time. So with that said, are there any questions? Comments? Yes. Uh, Okay. Yeah, that's possible too. It depends also on what you're doing in that repository and what the uh, current status of it is. You're right, Git can bind up, especially on a relatively slow machine in a Docker container when you can get a giant ISO into the uh, repository. It turns out not what it's optimized for. I'm filing a PF bug on that one, so I'm sure that'll get fixed for itself. <laughs> Other questions, concerns, your resume, the size is a question. Anything anyone wants to start at me in that perfect thing for Since then, they made the onboarding a lot easier with, uh, there's a VCSH bootstrap that gets you up and running, which is a lot better than the nonsense I used to have to do to get this stuff going. Um, after you complain uh, 15 times to people, eventually start fixing things. Uh, the trick to getting a change done in an open source project is to be so annoying they can't ignore you, which is really my entire life philosophy. <laughs> Other questions, concerns, angry thoughts about Git workflows, happy thoughts about Git workflows. <laughs> All right.
thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time.